So, with all the educators, people that teach instruction in the class, how many of you can honestly say you give your students a chance to know you personally by show of hands? That's quite, that's quite a lot, more than I thought. So, part of my uh, presentation is my way and my approach of solving some of the problems of teaching the students in my area, okay? And I call it Make America Think Again because a lot of it requires aspects of thinking and learning, but also um, working with the community, working with the college, and also working with biz business leaders. Okay, so on the first day of class, before I go into my syllabus, the first thing I try to illustrate is the state of Texas and some of the statistics in the state of Texas. And so um, Texas, I mean, I know we have a lot of people here from Houston and some other places from Texas, so we're big about bragging in Texas, being the biggest, the best, and all of those things that you, you probably hear a lot about. Um, so the GDP of Texas is, in the, I guess you could say, the top 10, and it's compared with the Russian Federation in terms of GDP. And uh, one of the things that um, Texas is known for is its export of petroleum, oil, fossil fuels, that kind of stuff. And so I like to get my students to know these things so they're aware of their surroundings because some of them are oblivious to some of these things. The second thing I talk about is Mountain View College. So I am an um, instructor at or faculty member here at Mountain View College in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Dallas, Texas um, is the second largest uh, state, uh, second largest city in the state of Texas. One of the things about Mountain View College that um, a lot of people don't know that it's a school to prison pipeline zip code. Okay, in addition to a school to prison pipeline zip code, is also a food desert zip code as well. So you have those hardships that some of our students in our communities are facing. Okay, and you can see from the median household pop, uh, income that is below $40,000. So you can kind of imagine some of the things our students are going, uh, are dealing with. Some of our students, not only are they taking economics for the first time, they're in college for the first time. So they're first generation college students as well. So these are the type of students that I have in my classes that I deal with on a daily basis. So some of the problems that I go through, some of you may go through as well, okay? So this is a little more statistics about our students. You can see from um, the full-time versus part-time that majority of our students are part-time. In addition to that, we are a Hispanic-serving institution. Majority of our students are Hispanic. In terms of academic versus technical, most of our students are there for academic purposes. In addition to that, these are some more statistics that we see. In the past years, we've seen an increase in female enrollment in, in majority of our classes than male enrollment in, in some of our classes. And some of the statistics show that the male um, population are more likely to withdraw or drop out more than the female. Okay? All right, so um, these are some more statistics that goes into success rates and everything, but since we're on a time constraint, I'm going to kind of go forward and get into the reason why I'm up here. Okay, some of the problems that I faced during my 12 years of teaching are how to enhance student engagement and motivation, how to create consistent ways of communicating economic principles, and how to use relevant examples and models in those classrooms. And the last component is how do I actually assess these things? Adam Smith, as we all know in this class, he speaks a lot about self-interest and social interest. And in his book, uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, this is a quote that I got from there. And it says, the natural effort of every individual to better his own condition is so powerful that it is alone and without any assistance, not only capable of carrying on a society to wealth and prosperity, but surmounting a hundred impertinent obstructions with the father of human laws too often to encompass its operations. So what motivates people to improve? What motivates them to want to achieve a better life? 
And so my students face these things, these obstacles, and these choices. When you're in a community and when you're in an environment and you don't have anybody around you that makes a certain level of income, then you, you tend to only confine to what you see. And so my job is to get students to think outside of the box and use practical ways to show how what I'm teaching in a principal's class can apply to different ways of living so they can actually understand that and possibly want to pursue that. So that's some engagement and motivation type of component that I try to instill in the class. So as you see on the PowerPoints, um, I try to incorporate community narratives, college narratives, uh, student learning outcome narratives, and tie those in with the business and industry narratives. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of go into those. So when we get into the community narrative and we talk about the community, you'll be surprised when I'm going to just give you a little bit of background. So at Mountain View College, um, I've been there seven years. Out of the seven years, I've gone through five different presidents. Five different presidents, right? And so with those presidents and these constant changes, I'm also a part of the strategic planning effort for our institution as well. So we have faculty members that work with the executive administrations to work on certain initiatives that if we have these turnovers, that things could still be consistent, right? And so when we talk about the community, we want to know and be informed on the things that the community does well, right? And from knowing what the things that the community knows well, we can relay that back to our college and we can relay that in our classroom. So some of the examples that I use in the textbook or referring to things in the textbook related to things that happen into the community. The college narrative. The college narrative is to be able to align the strategic plan with the things that the community does well, the narrative of the community. So um, we want to align those, those goals that the college has along with what the community does so we can support each other in times of need. So say, for instance, that the state of Texas, Texas Higher Education Board, starts to decrease our funding, right? We're going to need community support for some of these things. So when I go to a guest speaker, Mark Vesey, or when I go to a, a local businessman, Roland Parrish, and I ask him for $20,000, he can show empathy and sympathy of why I need that money. Right? And these are things that I've done um, in my classes. So when I bring in these guest speakers and I, I'm going to talk about that, I can also ask them, what can I do for you? So it's a dual process of give and take. All right, so the student learning narrative. So with the student learning narrative, why should students care? How do we create an environment to make students care? Now, as I sit here at this conference, and there have been um, many great presenters before me, a lot of us are speaking on similar things of why, how to create environments to make students care. Why should they care? And so everything that I'm saying is right around the same guidelines. It's just this is my approach of doing it, right? And so what I've tried to do is create outlets in my classrooms where students could get to know me personally, right? and also offer incentives to make them stay engaged and stay motivated and wanting to keep their interest in being a student at Mountain View College. Okay? So last but not least, the business industry narrative. So what we're looking at is creating partnerships. So when we look at the community aspect, when we look at the student aspect, the college aspect, and we combine all those together, we want to look at the way the industry or the people in our communities that uh, give employment, that give job opportunities, all of the above, how can we work together? How can we bring them into college and help them work together with us? Or how can I incorporate them in my classroom to get students to be motivated in order to replicate what they're doing in the class? Okay? So from each strategy that we address, I'm going to go into the strategies that I look at in order to answer some of these problems of student engagement, the creation of consistent, relevant instructional methods. So when we connect with the student, the student comes into the college, they progress through the classes that they take, not just economics, but just in general. 
and they complete where they get an associate's degree and they transfer over to a four-year university, they can actually get a job or they all have the skill set if they want to get a job to complete. So when we talk about the community strategies, one of the things that I try to initiate are things that are in the community to where I can do volunteer work. Volunteer work shows students empathy and it shows ways that students can get involved in learning more about the community. So this are uh, pictures of some of the activities that I've done. So the first picture is a picture of myself and some of the peers that work at Mountain View College, a DCCCD, and some of my students. So every semester we do a career day. And at this career day, I offer extra credit. So if students want to come, they could come by volunteer. And they can not only uh, work for the extra credit, but they get to work alongside me, the professor, and they get to know me better. From there, we eat lunch. We spend most of the day together working, and then we can ask each other questions and get to know me better. From there, these students that participate in these extra credit opportunities, they go out and they market the same opportunity or they market the experience to other students. From there, it becomes a chain reaction. So more students get involved, especially if they have a good experience. At the bottom is mayor, uh, former mayor Mike Rollins. So you can see he's in my class. That class has about 135 students in it, or had about 135 students in it. And so I don't have a budget for guest speakers, OK? A lot of times I approach these individuals. If I see them out somewhere, I'll just go up to them. Hey, my name is Professor Gray. I'm with Mountain View College. I love what you do. I'd love to have you come in my class. That's simple, just like that. And the first thing they say, who are you again, <laughs> right? I say, again, my name is Professor Reginald Gray. I love what you do. I admire what you do for our great city. And I would love for you to come and speak to my class. And they're thinking, like, why would I come and speak to your class, right? But I, without even having to get into why you have to speak to my class, they're thinking about, OK, this guy just approached me out of the blue, doesn't know who I am but he asked me to come and speak to my class. But why would I come and speak to your class out of any other class? And my thing is because we need to hear what you have to say. We have students that need to hear things beyond what you say in the media and the press. So we want to have an in-depth conversation. So some of the conversations that we have are on camera, some of them are not on camera, because I want them to feel comfortable when they come to the class. The college narratives are, the way they work is because I can't just simply say myself because I got in trouble for doing that. So um, about four years ago, I brought in one of the senators, Senator Royce West. I brought him into my class, and I didn't tell any of the upper administration about it. But one of his security called in to the police and said, um, the senator's coming, and we need a parking spot, and we need a secure parking spot. And they were like, what? Who is he coming to see? Uh, it says here, uh, uh, Gray. He's coming to see uh, Professor Gray. And so eventually I got the call, and they said, hey, if the senator's going to come to class or he's going to be on campus, you need to let us know. Don't just sneak the senator here, you know. And so I do a lot of things like that, right? So, so what I've done is I've had to acknowledge the college when I bring in guest speakers. So when they're prominent people, they at least know that they're there on the campus. And what they try to do is they leverage them after you know, we speak. So I have a guest speaker come in. They'll come, and we'll talk about ways that we can work together with the community. That's the whole purpose of that. Okay? This right here is a video with Mark Vesey. Now, I met Mark Vesey in the grocery store. I just walked up to him and said, hey, Mark, I love what you do. Want to come and speak in my class? And he looked at me, he's like, who are you? I said, I'm a professor at Mountain View College. My name is Reggie Gray. Uh, I've seen you before. We never met personally, but won't you come on out? We'll have a good time. And he gave me his number, I talked to his secretary. It was that easy. Sounds like bullshit, right? <laughs> but it's not. But anyways, this video is showing uh, Mark, uh, Mark Vesey, and he's talking about doing the sixth annual job fair at Mountain View College doesn't speak on our relationship, but our relationship started 
these job fairs when I met him over seven years ago, and I had him come and speak to my class. All right? So last thing I want to talk about in terms of student learning outcomes, so these are some of the initiatives that I put in. So inviting guest speakers, uh, service learning projects from field trips to internships, focusing on cognitive uh, development. The speaker right before me, Phil, he spoke about group presentations and group projects and how that's been beneficial to your class. And I've um, incorporated some of that in my class from previous conferences that I've uh, been fortunate to be able to attend. And last but not least, focusing on behavior change. So focusing on behavior change are some of those projects in order to change the student's way of, of thinking about approaching economics and how it actually affects them in terms of a livelihood basis. So in the student learning initiatives, these are some examples that um, I have in terms of extra credit. One of them is register to vote. So if a student registers to vote, which we really need in this country, um, I offer them extra credit. In Dallas-Fort Worth, we have a limited supply with minorities of blood and plasma. So if they show any type of record that they donate blood or they give plasma, I give them extra credit. If they volunteer at the North Texas Food Bank, which I do once a month, they can either come with me or they can go by themselves. The whole administration knows who I am, and so if they go, I give them extra credit. Uh, for dual credit students, they're the ones that are under the age of uh, 18. If they provide a college acceptance letter or a college admissions letter, I give them extra credit. Um, and the last but not least, a yoga class, as you see the picture below. So we offer, I offer these classes with the teacher at least once a month, and students could sign up, and they could take uh, yoga with me. And in that discussion, before we start doing class, we talk about meditation. We talk about things to help clear the mind. We talk about their problems. All these different things. So they're getting to know me personally. I don't have to do this. But I do this in order to not only market the class, but show them a better way of living. OK, so business industry narratives. So each semester, I also um, I do a trip to the Dallas Federal Reserve and also the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. So these are pictures of some of my students that go by volunteer only. And each semester, we do a whole day at the or half a day at the Federal Reserve. The Vice President of the Federal Reserve, Evan Koenig, is a former teacher of mine. He actually comes down or he brings in another um, executive from the Fed and we come in and we talk about different concepts. And not only we talk about it on a macro level, we talk about it on a micro level as well. Okay? So not only do I have politicians, I have NFL players, I have economists, I have businessmen, and I never paid any of them one dime to come. And not only do I not pay them a dime? I have them pay. <laughs> what I mean by that is at the, at the end, I do a, a game called Kahoot. And the Kahoot game is about either what they speak or about the actual individual. And from there, we do a series of games. So I play off the speaker's ego. Basically, that's what I'm doing, right, to get them to come out there. And then they answer these questions. And whoever wins, we get a cash prize. So I'll probably donate $40. I get out of my own pocket, and then the speaker will either match me or most likely they'll give more. I've had as much as $500 given to a student. So each time we do this, students get money, or in Ron Kurt's case, he gave floor seats to the Dallas Mavericks game and his parking pass. So just things like that. But everybody can incorporate this some way, somehow. You don't have to be in Dallas. You don't have to be in the metropolitan uh, city. You don't have to have somebody that's prominent. You can use a local mayor, you can lose, use the president of your local bank. But these are things that your student sees outside and inside of the classroom that make a difference. So that's what I do and I incorporate in my class. Okay, um, so these are some of the type of guests that I have in my classes. Okay, so some of the outcomes as you can see, um, so when I bring in some speakers, and I brought in Mayor uh, Rollins when he was the current mayor at the time, the new mayor now is actually a friend of mine as well, ironically he won. Um, but Mayor Rollins, that was our first time actually meeting when he came to our class. 
And when he came to my class, he told me he was in a rush and he could only stay 30 minutes and all this. I told him, I said, you might as well leave because I need you here an hour. If you can't stay an hour, then that defeats the purpose of me coming. And he looked at me like I was short. It's like, what? <laughs> but anyway, he stayed more than an hour. Some of the clip on the video, it shows the good time that we had in the class, actually. And he really enjoyed it. From there, he invited me for coffee, invited me to another coffee, talked to me about different um, organizations, committees at the city of Dallas that he wanted me to be a part of. He appointed me a commissioner of the Dallas Housing Authority in June. And so that was one of the articles that was in uh, Yahoo Finance. But that's just one thing. I mean, I've been on so many boards and, and organizations and things like that from making these, um, building these relationships with people in the community that I've got a reputation for not just doing it, but helping other colleges do it as well. Anyway, these are some of the success rates from my classes from 2014 all the way to 2019 in the summer. So it shows the ones that are highlighted or when I've incorporated some of these aspects of the initiatives in the class, and the ones that are not highlighted are the ones that I did not, okay? So I, each semester, I teach over 300 students. So it's a lot of students. So in some classes, I incorporate these. Some of them, I don't. My largest classes are about 150. My smallest are 25, OK? From there, these show some of the statistics from the surveys that I give my students. So I give surveys based on the guest speakers, based on the extra credit, and the group presentations. 